Ethics Group. I'm an associate professor at the School of Public Health, just over an MD1 over in the US. Um, I am I'm currently a normal, a normal guy. Um, from the 1st of January, though, I'll be taking over as the Vice Dean of Research and the head of the BioSteps domain within the school. Um, so if you're ever interested in doing any collaboration with our school, then from January, you come to me. Before then, you go to my current boss. Um, so I'll be talking about modeling and analytics in population health. Firstly, can I just define what is population health? Uh, because not everyone is, is completely aware of what it means. It's different from health in general. So I do not work with any data that comes from the hospital, right, because that, that is not really population health, it's not about the population, that's about patients. Instead, what we're interested in more is people like you, members of the population who may not be sick yet, but how we can try to prevent sickness and prevent disease. Um, so I, uh, I work in modeling and analytics, and um, I guess you guys, because you're data scientists, right? So analytics will be completely, you know more about analytics than I do, but maybe more I can tell you a little bit about modeling. So what is modeling? Um, by the way, in case you hadn't realized, I'm not from Singapore. Um, can you guess where I'm from? This might help. So I'm originally from Scotland. Imagine that you're in a, in a bar and you see uh, a man wearing a kilt. What would you think when you see the man wearing a kilt? Right. You may think, a few things may come to mind. But you might think, hey, this guy probably is quite canny or careful with his money. Um, so I don't want to go rounds with this guy because he might go off when it's his turn. Um, you might think, well, you've seen the film Brave, Scots are brave, therefore I don't get a fight with this guy because he'll keep on fighting with you. If you know a lot about us, you may know that the Scots have a bit of a drink problem, have a bad diet, etc. And if you really know us well, you might notice some particular adjectives which apply to Scots, like we're thrown or we could be a bit, a bit too. Now, all of these are stereotypes of Scots. Okay? Now, stereotypes um, have an element of truth in them. When you create stereotypes, you are essentially developing a model of the world. Right? You are not perfectly characterizing the world with a stereotype. Um, for example, I, I'm, I'm very generous with my money, and I'm, and I'm not, I don't have a bad diet, I think. Um, so, so when you, you're making some approximations when you create this kind of a stereotype. Okay? But it can be useful, it's a useful way of understanding the world. Right? Because actually many Scots do satisfy these kind of characteristics. So when we're doing modeling, um, when I'm talking about mathematical modeling, what we're trying to do is basically to take something which is very complex, like human beings, and represent them in a simple way that more or less captures all of the, all the, the dynamics of that system. Now, mathematical modeling in the area of population health has got a really, really long history. How long do you think it was back? 10 years? 20 years? If you go back to the year 1915, in volume one of the British Medical Journal, which is one of our top medical journals, um, you can see this paper by Ronald Ross. So Ronald Ross won the Nobel Prize for Medicine for discovering the, uh, the parasite, which uh, causes malaria, the, the vector which spreads it. Um, now, um, Although he won the Nobel Prize for that, that was not what he considered to be his main scientific achievement of his life. If you actually thought of his development of the field of mathematical epidemiology as being the thing which really characterized the success of his career. And if you look back at this, at this paper, it's a very short scientific paper, it's like just two pages long. On paragraph two, you can actually see one of the world's first mathematical models of a disease. Okay, set up as a series of ordinary differential equations which characterizes what we know about the epidemiology of that disease. So the kind of, um, so when we're doing modeling, we are using information, but in a different way from the way that data scientists would usually use information. So when you're looking at analytics for data, then essentially what you're trying to use that for when you're making decisions based on that is you, you take rich data, which are able to tell you pretty much everything that you, you can know about, about that underlying problem. In modeling, we kind of often will have very crap data. Um, honestly, data that I have is way worse than the kind of data that's available in the hospital. We have complete data for all patients, all the costs, all the tests that we've got done, and so on. Now, the kind of data that, that we have access to will be like from an outbreak of, of a disease with 100 cases in it. Right? So obviously, it's much, much smaller than that. So when we want to try to influence policy, and one of the things that our school does is we work very closely with the Ministry of Health in influencing their policies. Um, what we are trying to do is to capture a different kind of information, rather than information from data, information from our heads. 
right? So using expert knowledge, in a sense, in order to um, characterize relationships that may not be explicitly visible in the data set, where it's very small and it's got a lot of noise in it. Um, and so this is often as it meant as a cover for weak data. If I have really rich data, and I've worked with the National Environment Agency, where we're predicting dengue outbreaks, and there I've got data on my computer for like 100,000 cases over the last 10 years. That's a very rich data set. I don't need to do any modeling of that, because the data themselves is telling me everything I need to know about it. But when we're, up, we're working with some like the, the Zika outbreak that Keisha will talk about later, um, we had a few hundred cases only. And there, we really need to account for our knowledge of the system. So um, what I'll be talking about in this talk, in my, in my part, so I'll be talking for the first half or so of the, of the seminar, um, is about diabetes. Um, and I'll be talking about the individual-based model that we develop for diabetes, um, which is influencing um, our colleagues in the ministry. So what I'm showing you here are data from some national health surveys which are conducted, have been conducted every six years by the Ministry of Health. Okay? This is the three surveys which were conducted in the 90s and the noughties. And what, it, what, what they do for this is that they will recruit 5,000 or 6,000 adults in the population, and then each one of those adults will fill this test to see if they've got diabetes or not. Um, and so what I'm presenting here is the prevalence of diabetes, DM is for diabetes mellitus, um, in working age adults. So if you, ju if you just look at these three data points, you think, well, this is a pretty, pretty boring plot, right? If you're trying to predict what the future burden of diabetes would be, you probably think, well, it looks like it's staying constant, maybe going down a little bit. So I'll show you the data that have been published from the most recent National Health Survey. So in 2010, we saw that the prevalence of diabetes had risen to around about 13%. Uh, I'm not very good with numbers, I can't remember what it was. Maybe 13%, maybe 12%. Um, now, it seems like there's a small amount, 2% increase. Diabetes are a very slow disease. You get diabetes usually towards the end of your life. If we've had over a six year time period a rise of 2% in the absolute percentage, that actually is a really significant amount. Now, if we're trying to predict what the future burden of diabetes will be, let's say the year 2050, it should be well beyond the current government in Singapore. Um, then uh, we obviously cannot just expect that we can take the, these raw data and extrapolate past trends into the future. Because we tried that here and it didn't work, we did this at all. So what else could we do? Um, one of the, ma the major, the number one driver of diabetes is actually not obesity or overweight, it's age. The older you are, the more likely you are to have developed diabetes so far in your life. Um, so what we could do, if you want to predict the future burden of diabetes is, we deconstruct the problems. We say, well, I know a lot about the aging of the population, and I can project how the population will age to the year 2030, to the year 2050, and so on. And I know now what is the relationship between age and the prevalence of diabetes. Maybe stratified by ethnic group or by gender or both. So then I can then project what the demographics will look like in the future, the main driver, and use that to predict what diabetes will look like. Now that will give you a kind of an okay approximation of reality, but still just an approximation. In particular, this is the second most important thing, which is, as I mentioned, overweight or obesity. We know that people are getting more and more overweight. There's another mechanism which may drive future trends. Um, here I'm showing you the prevalence of overweight, again in adults, again from the National Health Service, in the year 2004 and the year 2010. So across the board, this has risen, in particular amongst younger adults. Um, we think, in particular, that for, um, there's a transition from, for, for guys between NS and civilian life. Because when you're in NS, you're, you're burning off lots of calories, you're also eating lots of calories. Then you become a civilian again. Um, and you're still eating all the calories, but you're not burning them off anymore. And, and exercise is a punishment, right? So you don't <laughs> want to exercise anymore. So there, we see that um, it seems like in that, you know, young, young males in their 20s are especially overweight um, relative to the past. So, if, so this represents basically a fundamental change to the rules. We cannot just expect the prevalence will be the same for different age groups in the future if more people are overweight or obese. 
So instead, what we could do would be that we'll forecast the population age structure, and we'll also forecast what the obesity prevalence will be like going forward. And so we can combine both of these risk factors together to project the burden of diabetes. Okay? So when I'm talking about modeling, that's, that's kind of like what I mean. Each of these components is actually quite simple from an analytics perspective. But from a modeling perspective, we're bringing it all together in a more complicated way. So we've been developing a, a platform within our school called DEMOS, Demographic Epidemiological Model of Singapore. I was really, really proud of that acronym. <laughs> um, so what this is, this is an individual level life history model. It combines um, survival analysis and what we know from statistical demography to simulate individuals at a pop, pop, the whole population level, um, how uh, their lifetimes will change over time. You know what I mean, right? We're, we're simulating their lifetimes over time. Um, so within each individual, because we're representing people as individuals rather than just as a population as a whole, then we can assign characteristics to those individuals that may vary dynamically over time. For example, there'll be a man. And some of these characteristics will be risk factors for disease. <coughs> so by, simulate, by developing this as a simulation model, we can simulate from the past through to the future, and then at different time points, we can then project down from the simulation to get a, 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 a simplified representation. So for example, we could project census tables at different time points, and then check, are we actually reproducing the census that we've observed? We can project down and get um, national health surveys and say, are we reproducing what the Ministry of Health has measured? So the kind of data that goes into this um, is, is small, but kind of chaotic, in the sense that we have quite a lot of different data sets that, we're, that are providing different kinds of information for our model. So we're taking data from national statistics, so like the census, which is conducted every 10 years. We take some of um, data from the, the yearbook of statistics, which uh, SingStat publishes yearly. And so we can use this to get information about uh, things like mortality rate and how it's changing over time, or how fertility rate changing over time. And that's, that's the drivers of how the demographics of the, of the population will look like. We also take um, cross-sectional health surveys like the ones that the Ministry of Health conduct. This has been every six years so far. This tells us information about things like prevalence of risk factors and prevalence of disease in different groups in the population. You'll note that there's a lot of uncertainty on those. You look at the bottom symbols are very wide. Yeah. And that's because when you start cutting them up by different groups in the population, then you, you find the sample sizes are quite small. We also combine this with data from our own cohort studies at the school ones. So a cohort study is where you invest a lot of money recruiting people um, into a study, uh, and it's like millions of dollars for this, and then you measure a lot of them at baseline, and then you basically wait for them to die. <laughs> and you can use what you measure at baseline to get you information about what the risk factors are for death, or for different diseases. So like if you get cancer, then your cancer will be notified to the registry of diseases um, over at MOH. And so we can then relate our cohort data to subsequent disease. Now you can imagine that not many people get cancer in a typical one year period, so we have to recruit a large number of people based on. So our cohorts are around about 100,000 people from across Singapore. Now for some of these, we actually follow them up and we get them at a second time point. Um, and so we can use this to understand how disease changes in the same group of people over time. Okay, so we have to merge all of these kind of data together. So I'm going to give you a kind of a simplified representation of the model so you get an idea of how we do it, what modeling approach is. So um, this will get populated with, with arrows and boxes. So we'll start off with demographic variables. So we take the most important demographic variables, so age, gender, and ethnic. We know there's differences, for example, in ethnic groups for, the, for disease. So um, the prevalence of diabetes in Indian and Malay is much higher than it is for Chinese. For ethnic Europeans, we are at the lowest genetic risk for diabetes. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> A few people in the audience might be happy, but most of you not. So, um, so this, because these are important risk factors for pretty much everything that goes on after this, we'll use these and we'll feed them into a model of the demo demographics of the population. 
So this model then creates as output uh, trajectories for individuals, which gives you the time at which they give birth to their baby, uh, the time at which they die, and also migration in and out of the country. Demographic variables also feed into a model of BMI. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a subsequent slide. It essentially gives us a, a BMI trajectory, which accounts for typical changes over your lifetime. And this BMI trajectory, together with demographics, feeds into a model which gives us as output incidence of diabetes and also prevalence. Incidence is new cases, prevalence is total cases over your life. Um, and because diabetes is a known risk factor for death, as well as other diseases, so we put this one back into the demographic model. I really wish I could remove this box. So we have a genetic model as well, but it's really just for fun because we've got a lot of genetic stuff over in our school. Um, it doesn't contribute anything, so you pretend it's not there. Um, but essentially that gives us an extra input into the diabetes model. And because we want to be able to project the economic burden of disease, then we also want to work out who in the population um, has diabetes and are they working or not? and what is the contribution to the labor force. So we have built up we have another model which is of individuals moving between being out of work and in work, um, which gives us a work trajectory, and we combine this with the diabetes incidence to get a measure of the amount of diabetes in the workforce, as well as in the population as a whole. When you want to influence policy, what we find is that one of the most important things is to be able to put a dollar cost, because the Ministry of Health is not they're not really in charge. They, they, the Ministry of Finance is the one that's in charge. So if they want to be able to say that something is going to be a, a burden to the health of the country, MOF is going to say, I don't care. If they say it's going to be a burden to the economics of the country, MOF will say, okay, we should do something about it. <laughs> so um, the demographic model, I'll just talk a little bit about that. So it is of the various aspects of your life. So for example, we have mortality rates, which we know change over time. And we've basically built, uh, using Mark Hobson Monte Carlo, we've built a model which projects what that will look like over time. Um, fertility rates have been going down even within the two decades that we've got the model set up for. Um, so the peak fertility is a bit later, and then overall fertility is lower. Um, the data that SingStat published is actually not very good for estimating this. So uh, what they all give us is a fertility rate in people aged 15 to 19, 20 to 24, 25 to 29. But if you think about it, you probably know people aged 25 and aged 29. Um, they have quite different fertility rates. Not a lot of people aged 25 are having kids. A fair number of people aged 29 are. So it changes quite a lot even within those kind of bins that they will use for their aggregations. The hardest thing for the demographic model was actually to model migration, which is a very sensitive topic, so there's not a lot of good data on this. Uh, we know from other settings that there's a typical migration pattern for age. So people tend to migrate if they are aged less than five, or aged like around about um, late twenties to late thirties. <coughs> so basically, when you are when you're working age and you have kids, but the kids are not yet at school, then migration can happen. Once your kids start school, you don't want to migrate anymore. So we, we find this in other countries, and we were able to reverse engineer it for Singapore by looking at the change in the age pyramids that are published by Singstead. Um, uh, okay, and we've done this for different ethnic groups, but it all looks very similar to the one. So what this allows us to do then is to project how the profile of the population will change over time. So if you go back to about the 1970s, it really was an age pyramid. So age pyramids are so-called because they look like pyramids um, in some countries. Uh, by the 1990s, the base of the pyramid has moved up and you have this kind of flat part of the bottom. And we can see that by the year 2050, we're looking at more like an age pair bar of the pyramid. So I'm going to go pear shape right now because you have too many more people. Okay. Um, so we have a we built a model of BMI, which I alluded to earlier. So what we're doing here is we have um, data from our cohort studies, which tell us about uh, individuals at baseline and at one round of follow-up. Right, so we have the BMI at two time points. Okay? Um, and by looking at 
the patterns from across the whole cohort were able to build a longitudinal model which is individual levels. We use a hierarchical model where we've got um, uh, uh, hyperparameters which govern the variability between individuals. Okay. Uh, what this characterizes is a very typical profile for weight. So on average, people put on weight around about their late 20s, uh, and you kind of you keep on putting on weight for some time. Then you start to lose weight again when you get about 50 or so. Right. So we can characterize that using this model. This lets us project what the future burden of overweight and obesity will be by looking at changes in the youngest age group that we've observed in our data sets. So, so Singapore will start to look more and more like Scotland over time. <laughs> um, so the final model I want, that I want to talk about within the overall framework is our model of diabetes. So, um, looking at the size of the audience, there's probably are one or two people who've got diabetes in the, in the room. Okay. Um, but there's probably more people in the room who have diabetes but don't know about it. Right. So quite often, because you, often you'll have diabetes but you just don't know about it because you've not been tested for it. So it's not like flu. If you've got flu, then you know you've got it because you've got like, horrible symptoms of it. But actually, probably around about 50% of people who have diabetes in Singapore don't know they have diabetes. One of the major problems when we're trying to reduce diabetes in the population. Um, so we have um, our, our cohort where we have like two time points and for many people they'll have started off without diabetes but the second time potentially we find that they've got diabetes and we don't know when they develop diabetes during that time window. So what we've done is we developed a model of potentially cryptic unobserved diabetes which um, depends on a bunch of risk factors like age and ethnic group and so on. Um, and we fitted this using a combination of Marco T. Monte Carlo, an important sampling, based on the BMI data that we had before, and the demographics. Right. So um, by tracking the population's aging um, and ill health, we are able to forecast um, what the, the burden of the disease will be. Um, so for example, we can look at what we think the profile for uh, overweight, uh, obese and overweight will be. And I use that to project what we think the future prevalence of diabetes will be. You may have read about in the news that we're expecting to have a million diabetics. Maybe. I read this because uh, it's, it's about my work, so when I found <laughs> it, I was like, okay. um, So uh, our, our projections of one million diabetics. Um, have actually been fed through to the Ministry of Health and were cited when Singapore declared war on diabetes last year. So I'm a bit of a, I'm a warmonger. Fired the first shot in the diabetes war. Uh, I think this is really unfortunate. I don't think we're going to win this war, but never mind. Okay, I'm being recorded, right? So the thing about me, about not winning the war, let's, let's cancel that one out. <laughs> Okay, now the purpose of doing modeling is not really because we want to just project over numbers. We want to be able to look at um, what the burden of this will be and how can we try to change things so that the burden is less. So what we can do with this simulation model is to look at the effect of different interventions. Um, what would the, the downstream benefits of those be? Um, so if we are, so we don't really care about diabetes. Diabetes in itself doesn't really matter. We care about not diabetes, but the complications that come from that. So if, you're, if you have diabetes, you're at higher risk of amputation, stroke, heart disease, etc. Okay. Um, so when we are thinking about interventions, these will be interventions which either focus on the risk factors for diabetes or diabetes itself. So what are risk factors? Overweight. So an intervention which tries to reduce weight in the population will target the risk factor, lower diabetes, and therefore lower all of this. Um, what else could you do? You could have an intervention which focuses on the disease itself. So screening people to try to identify people who have diabetes and get them onto medication. That won't change the risk factors, but it means that these will have lower risk. <coughs> so I'll talk about now two such interventions. Um, so one is a weight loss program. So one of the ministries is asking us, how can you try to assess how much if they give us a weight loss program and they can describe what they think the effect of it will be in terms of like reducing weight, can we then say what will the effect be in reducing diabetes? 
Okay. So for this, we're going to project under no changes what we think the future burden of diabetes and some of the complications. So for example, here for AMI, that's heart attacks and strokes. So we think that by the year 2050, we're going to have basically about a three-fold rise in the number of heart attacks and strokes. It's a really good time to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Not a radiographer, but any other kind of doctor. So MOH will come to us and say, okay, we want to make our program, um, we think that it will roll out on the population level uh, and it will reduce the weight by some amount. Can you model it? And so what we say is, well, we need to transform this from something that's very big, just stupid words, I want to get numbers, right? I want to be able to describe this in a more mathematical way. So we'll come up with a, uh, an algorithmic way to describe it. So for example, we say, let's assume all adults in the year 2018 who have a BMI which is medium weight.
achieve that talks for me. And then because I, I work with NUHS, um, so NUHS is part that controls this part of the country, so we can actually then break things down by the different regional health service, which is in charge of the different parts. So we can use that to project what is the burden of different diseases in the different RHSs. And not just to say, this is just now, we can actually also project into the future, because we know where new housing estates are going to be developed for the year 2030. For example, the Tenga estate around about North Jiro. You know, that will probably, uh, it will be up and running by 2030. And we know what the typical age profile is for new estates. Right? Again, it tends to be like young married couples, maybe with young kids. So we can, from what we've learned about from past new towns, we can then project what the evolution of new estates like Tenga will be, and use that to project what the burden of disease will be in each of these, each of these parts of the country. Okay. Oh yeah, and then, because it's individual levels, we actually we can zoom all the way down to like blocks and say this is like the what we expect the prevalence should be for different diseases in the block. And that's used for our NUHS for their uh, like the screening programs. Like which blocks should we target for screening? Okay. I'm talking a little bit too long, so I'm going to hand over to you in a second. Um, so, uh, how do I still do something? Thank you. Done, right? This week. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, so I was going to talk about smoking, but I won't because I'm, I've spoken too long about diabetes. So what I'll do now is I'm going to hand over to Keisha to talk a little bit about some of the work that she's doing on Zika from the Zika outbreak of last year. Uh, so it's a, a very different flavor. Diabetes is a very slow disease. Zika, very quick. So we had an outbreak in just a couple of months, um, and it caused a lot of panic and required lots of, lots of overtime from our, from our team. So Keisha will talk a little bit about that. Okay. okay, I guess just now Alex was just sharing about something that's like non-communicable disease. But you must be familiar with what happened in Singapore last year. We had the Zika outbreak and it pretty much the whole world knew about it. CDC in America was talking all about it. We had travel bans or travel restrictions to Singapore. So exactly when it was published, it was published on 27th of August in Straits Science. That is our most recognized journal as academics. <laughs> you get it the straight times, you make it big. <laughs> Alright, so, and you must be familiar with this mosquito. I think it irritated you all quite a bit. This is the Aedes aegypti, also responsible for transmitting dengue. So the same mosquito transmits Zika in Singapore as well. So the very next day, suddenly they tell you 41 cases. Oh my goodness. But actually not really, because it's from the retrospective testing of cases. So what we did was that with the data given to us by MOH, we found that the first known case actually dates back to 31st of July. So it's not just like, oh, suddenly ministry is hiding information. It's just that nobody knew Zika was actually really spreading at that point in time. And when they found out, it dates back all the way to 31st of July. So Ministry of Health actually brought in together a group of people. So we call ourselves the Singapore Zika Study Group. And the work that I'm presenting today is actually really a collaboration between everyone that is here. So researchers at the School of Public Health, namely us, made, um, we were helping the ministry with just answering two basic questions, such as how quickly was the outbreak going to grow um, as it was unfolding without interventions, and how widely dispersed was the Zika outbreak when it was happening itself. So answering the first part, we had case data given to us by the Ministry of Health day by day, they were coming in. and. Um, if you know that an individual is infected with Zika, you know that this individual can go on to infecting mosquitoes. So Zika is, does not really transmit much from individual to individual, but it transmits faster through a vector. And this vector is the Aedes mosquito. And these mosquitoes can go on biting you. And we found out that on average, an infected individuals would lead to the infection of about three people. And this is actually at the construction site. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, where the outbreak was happening. It was somewhere in Aljuni area. So that was, that was what we saw at the construction site. So this was the case data as it was coming in. And if there were no interventions, we found that about 90% of the population would be infected. Yeah. But then again, having said that, this is if the scenario was the same, 
in the rest of the island like it was at the construction site. But we know that at the construction site, you have like puddles of stagnant water. So there was actually an avenue for mosquitoes to start breeding and then biting human beings around the uh, construction site. So NEA and, uh, and uh, Ministry, sorry, National Environment Agency and the Ministry of Health, they panicked a little, but they immediately activated their intensive control measures at that area. So vector control measures that were targeted at getting rid of breeding sites as well as isolating cases. And they managed to sort of bring down the transmissibility of Zika. So now we're seeing about one infected individual could potentially lead to the infection of about one case. And if, you, if you're familiar with the epidemiology, then you would know that this would lead to no longer, the disease no longer spreading further. So we found that if the intervention was, was successful and less than 10% of the population was now then affected. So the next thing that we did was to look at how widely dispersed was the Zika um, outbreak in Singapore. We must have been familiar with SARS. I think we all talk about SARS all the time. When you have an infected case with SARS, you do contact tracing. You ask the individual, okay, who have you contacted and then who are the closest contacts you have? But you can't actually do this for Zika because you cannot contact trace mosquitoes. You cannot say, hey, which one you bite today? Tomorrow who will you bite? But actually from the pattern in space and time, so from the case data, we knew where the cases were getting, in, I mean, where people live and work, and when they were getting infected or when they started showing symptoms, you can sort of project how the cases would be like. So, so this is uh, how we represented the 455 confirmed cases up to the end of November. And you can see how the disease is sort of like spreading around people here. So Zika is actually a disease that is um, asymptomatic. So majority of the cases um, actually do not, um, do not feel it. So you may actually be infected with Zika, but because you do not know that you're infected, you go to work. So you're actually able to transmit the, the disease at, at your workplace as well. So from here we noticed that um, you can, um, what our model could do was to not only just say who infected whom, but where were they infected? Because we had the case uh, home and work address. So that's what this model is doing here. So for, Alex, could you click mix on the next slide? Thank you. So for example, individual number four was infected at work by a cluster that was seated in his workplace. So this is in Algeria. And this cluster was seated by someone who, one of his co-workers. So his co-workers infected first, infected the mosquitoes around him, and then led to the infection of him. He then can go on to seat clusters at his home and work because he does not know he's sick. So he goes, he goes back home to Woodlands where he is now able to let the mosquitoes around him bite and then you have other cases that spring off from that. So both at his home and his workplace. So this is how we see um, the mosquito cannot actually fly from Aljunit to Woodlands. We know that the mosquitoes, yeah, they only try, the most you can fly is about 150 meters and you know that's the furthest. But it is the human that brings the disease around. So this is how we see the zero naive part of the island being affected with Zika. So you see, oh, there's a class in Algeria. Next thing you know, the class is in Bishan. Next thing you know, the class is in Serangoon. So why is that? So it's because human move from places to places. What we also notice is that their, the secondary cases can go on to seed further clusters. So they go and bring it to their workplace and their homes and etc. And you know that now about um, a large number of people are actually infecting people at home and infecting people at work and a large number of people are getting infected at home and work. So in the past, MOH usually just collects home data. They say that, oh, if you have the residential address, you can, you can sort of target such infectious disease. But in this case, we say, no, you can't. And vector control measures that were targeted at home, only because you know at your house, you fumigate, they will tell you, let me check your, your pots and your pots to see if there's water, stagnant water there. You realize that that does not contribute to most of the infection. In fact, you need to also look at what happens at the workplace. So what we did was to evaluate, is it, is it better to just look at a home alone? Like what if we assume that Zika could only transmit at home versus if you now say that it can be transmitted at home and work? And we did some modeling with that. We found that the model that, that um, looked at both home and work was able to um, better explain the disease itself. So the time between infection was about five days and with the median distance about 400. That's pretty much the rough size of how people move between classes. Yeah, 
So um, when you're studying vector borne diseases, it's actually really important to understand that uh, spatial information is very, very important. So that's what we did there. We did some spatial temporal modeling. And we do not exactly know, as in, like we mentioned here, we look at how cases are. We don't have the exact place where individuals are infected, but the modeling acts as a lens for us to see, okay, this is the potential route in which you have cases being infected by this way. So, yeah, I guess um, that concludes our part, because I think we're running out of time. Okay, so I hope this gives you a bit of a sense of what, what population health is about, how it's different from clinical work, um, and then also about uh, what modeling involves. So it involves taking data, which are often not very rich. Here, how many data points do we have? Either a few hundred or one, one outbreak. Right. So you know, we're looking at data where actually the size is so much smaller than you would be able to get if you were getting data straight into the web or getting it from an existing database. Um, okay, so I hope you don't mind. I'm going to take advantage of this to do a little bit of advertising. Um, I've got a job I need to fill. Um, so within my research center at EMHS, we're looking to hire a research fellow who, um, who ideally have a PhD at so this stage, they get another day sort of ready in the field. Um, and the, their main role will be to develop an online panel. We've got some funding from the Ministry of Health in the last um, set of grant calls. Uh, and so I kind of urgently need to hire someone for this. Also, um, I was speaking to one of my colleagues, one who has all the data on 100,000 dengue cases over the last decade, as well as sent like a million records about mosquito breeding. Um, and so she's looking to hire a data scientist over at National Environment Agency at EHI. This again would ideally be someone who's got uh, stats or uh, computational biology or biostats or data analytics background. Um, so if you're interested in either of these two jobs, contact me for the first one or raise your hand the second one. Uh, and then finally, Keisha wants to advertise. <laughs> okay, so um, we, together with um, MIT, so NUS, um, we, have, we organize this thing called a datathon, which is basically hackathon with actual data. Um, and we had one just early, uh, no, mid of this year, sometime in uh, end of June, um, where we got a group of people came down together to just hack on data over two days. Um, if you're interested, look out for it. Uh, we will be having one in June next year. So the web page is still up. You can go and check it out. Um, and yeah, we hope to see you there. <laughs> Thank you. It's free, but it's free of charge. All right, thank you, Alex and Kisha. Pretty fascinating stuff. Uh, I think we still have some minutes, so we'd like to. Oh, it's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 